Welcome to Calvin Presbyterian Church. My name is Peter Cameron. I'm an elder here at the church. And uh, our pastor, Kevin White, is uh, not here today. Uh, he will be preaching from home. He is being quarantined. If you haven't heard, uh, his wife has some symptoms and is being tested right now for COVID. And we'll get the results of those in the not distant future. Why don't we start our, 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 our worship service with prayer? O oh God, the gift of your Son is a life-changing treasure that is truly beyond all value. Your generosity and goodness astound us. Inspire us to teach your commandments and share your gospel, that all may enter the joy of Christ. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 90. Please join me in this responsive reading. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. From, From everlasting, everlasting to everlasting, everlasting you are God. God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals. For, For a thousand years in your sight are like, like yesterday when it is past, or like, or like a watch in the night. Our opening hymn is Let All Things Now Living. Those here in the sanctuary are invited to listen and meditate on the words those who are worshiping from home are invited to sing along. The words will be on your screen. The prophet Zephaniah has proclaimed, the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. Neither silver nor gold will be able to save. Nothing which we possess is able to offer salvation. It is only the gift of God's grace that can save. Let us therefore trust in that gift as we confess this morning. Please join me in our corporate prayer of confession followed by a moment of personal confession. Let us pray.
Please take a moment to greet one another with the peace of Christ in whatever way you are able, perhaps a wave or a text message or even a comment on Facebook, and continue to find ways to share the peace of Christ throughout the week. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Throughout this uh, uh, account, Jesus is speaking. For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And uh, for uh, uh, the people in the congregation, um, we're going to be listening to the sermon, and it's going to be on the monitor over t- on the uh, side with the, uh, the road. So if you need to change your, your pew, uh, go ahead now. Thank you.
that our eyes may be enlightened and we may know the hope to which we have been called through Jesus Christ. Amen. So when I was a kid, uh, I had a chemistry set. It was the standard kind that, that a kid would have. Various vials of, of chemicals, some, some small beakers and other basic supplies, and a little booklet with a whole bunch of different experiments you could do. But I never fully used it. Even though I thought it was, it was cool, even though I wanted to do all these different experiments. I used it some, um, but, but actually not a whole lot. And here's why, as I think back on it. I was afraid. Not of, uh, certainly not of, not of blowing anything up or anything crazy like that, right? That was actually part of the appeal, right? To a, to a chemistry set when you're a kid. The chance that something like that might happen. No, I was afraid, afraid that if I used it, I wouldn't have it. I can distinctly remember thinking about, about doing one of the experiments, looking through the book and finding one that, that I thought would be really neat to do and, um, thinking about doing one of those experiments and then thinking, but if I do that, I'm going to use up most of, of this particular chemical. And if I use up most of it, then I won't have it to use. I was afraid to use it because if I used it, I wouldn't have it. I do this, by the way, with, with other things too. Um, Especially maybe uh, candy I like. I don't have too much of a sweet tooth, but, but there are particular um, candy and stuff like that that I, that I do really like. And I do the same thing a lot. I, I save it so that I will have it. But then I never get around to eating it because I want to save it so that I'll have it to eat and enjoy at some other time. And so what happens is I never actually eat and enjoy it. Do you ever do this? Maybe not with candy or, or chemistry sets, but, but maybe with something else. Not use something precisely because you want to make sure you have it to use. But all that does is mean that at some point, the chemicals in their little vials or that delicious candy, they expire. And so, ironically enough, it's precisely the worry about not having it that ends up being the reason that you never have it. Do you ever do this? Can you relate to this? I really hope you can. It would, it would make me feel better if you're in this with me. Well, certainly the, the third servant in this parable this morning, he can relate. This here is the second parable in a row from Jesus. It follows immediately from the, the parable that we looked at last, uh, last week. Jesus here is telling this second parable following the heels of what we looked at last week, the, the parable of the ten, ten bridesmaids. That, the one that, that came after Jesus had spent all of chapter 24 talking about the importance and the need to be faithfully watching and waiting for the day of the Lord and, and how to live faithfully and expectantly in the meantime. You remember that parable from last week? It began, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like... And he tells that parable about preparing with enough oil to keep your light shining even, even into the unexpected dark of night, right? Well, then immediately following that one, he launches right into this parable from this morning. For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his servants and entrusted his property to them. For it is as if. What is the, the it here? It's a continuation of what the last parable was about, the kingdom of heaven, what the kingdom of heaven will be like for it, for the kingdom of heaven is as if a man going on a journey summoned his servants and entrusted his property to them. And so then Jesus goes on and he, he tells this, this parable about this man going far away for a bit and in the meantime his servants have been entrusted with his money with a lot of his money, five talents, two talents, and one talent. Now, uh, we hear the word talent, and um, a talent has come to mean something that you're 
you're good at, some ability that you've been gifted with, right? And that's fine. We can we can extrapolate here, but but we need to also bear in mind and be clear about the fact that at this time, when when Jesus was telling this story, the word talent, it did not mean that you were good at something. It meant money. It meant a lot of money. It was a it was a certain measure of money. That's what a talent meant. One talent was roughly equal to the amount of money that the average laborer could expect to earn in 15 to 20 years. 15 to 20 years worth of work, worth of wages. That's one talent. We are talking here in this parable, we are talking about an absurd, exaggerated amount of money. Even the third servant there, that that we might want to feel bad for him, that he only got one talent while uh, the others got two and five. Don't feel bad for him. 15 to 20 years worth of wages. This is an absurd parable with an absurd premise. Why? Because parables are about painting a picture that shows you something. And sometimes in order to to draw your attention to, to that something, a picture has to be exaggerated to make sure you get the point. And so there they are, these three servants, each given an absurd amount of money with no instruction on what to do with it. All they know is that they have been entrusted with it. That it's both theirs and not theirs at the same time. And so the first two, they take the five talents and the two talents and they go and they they do some, some business of some kind. And they end up doubling what they each had. They put those talents to work. They, they used them and they grew. But the third servant, he just takes one talent, he digs a hole, and he buries it. He wants to make sure he doesn't not have it in the future. And so a long time later, the the master comes back. The the first two servants go to him and say, say, look, you gave us five talents and two talents, and, and look at this, here's five more and two more. And the master commends them and says to each of them, enter the joy of your master. But the the third servant, he goes and he he digs up the the one talent that he had had buried. And he he says, I know you are a a harsh man. And I was afraid. So I hid your talent in the ground. And he is not commended. In fact, he's condemned. He's, He's condemned for being too, too timid, too fearful to, to risk, to use what he had been given. Right? That's what he's condemned for. It's actually not that he, he went out and, and did something wrong. It's, it's that he was too fearful to do anything at all. I suspect that, that had the, the first two, um, had they just, uh, had they gone and um, gone out with those five talents and those two talents and and had had used them but had lost them all and they had come back with nothing because that's how um, that's how investments that's how using money works sometimes right sometimes it works out sometimes it doesn't but but I suspect that the the condemnation still would have only been left for the third servant because he's the one that let his fear control what he was doing it's his fear that's the problem here right. So rather than entering into the joy of his master, he, he finds himself out in the, in the darkness. Now I want to be, I want to make sure we're clear here. This, this is not a parable about, um, about hell or, or anything like that. Remember, this is a, this is a story that begins absurdly exaggerated. And it ends absurdly exaggerated. That's sometimes how parables work, and it's all to make a point. The first two lived into what they had received, and so they entered into the joy of their master, of their Lord. But the the third, so worried about not having what he had received, so worried about, about not having it, he never lived into it. And so he never actually ended up really receiving it, did he? His fear of losing it ironically meant that he never had it. 
that he lost it just pretty much as soon as he had gotten it. This third servant dug a hole of fear. Master, he says, I knew that you were a harsh man, so I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent. Your, I buried it in the ground. But look how the master responds. You knew that, did you? Let me suggest that the master's rhetorical question here, his question back to the servant, you knew, did you? It is not a confirmation of his servant's suspicions. It is a very, it is, it is a questioning of them. Is that really how you see me? You really think that's how I am as someone to be afraid of? As a harsh and vindictive person? Listen, fear makes us do a, a lot of things. It makes us, it makes us go dig a lot of holes. It makes us think that, that we are holding on to something when really we are losing it. It wasn't even so much that the, that the third servant was, was punished by, by having even the little he had, he had, he had taken, taken away. He had, before that even happened, he had chose to live as if, as if he had nothing. He buried it. And in so doing, that's when he lost it. Like all those, those, those chemistry set vials that I never used. This is a parable about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And what we see here is that it is like living into what we have been given and finding out that using it is gaining it and then some. Because you see the, the gospel, the good news, is that Jesus has loved you so fully and so perfectly that he gave everything for you, up to and including his very life as a free gift. And so any notions that your Lord is somehow a harsh master that, that you have to fear, those are shown to be lies by the life that he led, by the cross that he died on, and the tomb that was left empty that Easter morning. So there is no need for more fear dug holes. The world has enough holes. And so let me make sure that, that I say this as we think about, um, about this parable of talents given and, and given to be used and live, lived into. Let me be sure I say, I say this. If we are not living generously because of fear, that's not good. And that is not our calling as people of God. And so what we need is, is to, to again hear the good news of Jesus Christ. But also, if we, are, if we are giving because of fear, whether it's some sort of personal existential fear that, that God won't love us unless we give or, or, or whatever, or even if it's, if it's giving because of, um, when we think about giving to the church, if it's, if it's giving because it's a, a fear of something like changing church demographics or, or institutions and, and a fear of losing that, I'm, I'm not sure that that's any better because the gospel is not about fear. It's about the perfect love of Jesus that drives out fear. See, this parable is not a threat about what might happen if we don't do the right thing, if we don't get it exactly right, or if we, if we don't use our money or our other talents in just the right way. That's not what this parable is about. What it is about is a statement about what it means to, to enter into the joy of our Lord, a joy that, that comes, that can only come by leaning into and, and leaning on the profoundly generous, sacrificial, absolutely free, but completely costly grace of Jesus Christ. That is what we are called to live into. That is what we are called to be a part of. That who we are called to be is a people living into the, the kingdom of heaven here and now, even as we wait and watch faithful, faithfully and, and eagerly and expectantly 
for its fulfillment. So whenever we are talking about stewardship, which which we are in this time of year with in the in the church, whenever we are talking about stewardship, that is what we are talking about. And again, we can extrapolate this to, to any number of things, things that we are called to be stewards of, being stewards of our time, of our energy, stewards of, of grace and hope and invitation and welcome as we, we think about the ministry of the church. But also the truth is that in this, in this life, this life as we live, as we, as we wait and, and watch for the coming of the kingdom in all its fullness, there's also no getting around it. Material wealth and, and money in particular. This is the, the currency, one of the main currencies in our society, in our culture. This is one of the main currencies of, of value and importance and, and security, right? And I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. It, it, just, it just is. It's, just, it's a fact of, of how, how our societies work. And it's, so it's also the, the thing that, that allows and enables us to engage in all sorts of things that we are called, called into and called to live out. But, but what this means is that, is that how we view, how we treat even things like our, like our money, right? Like Jesus is talking about here. Our attitudes towards it and our, and our action, actions with money, it, it says a lot about, about who or what we trust what we value, where we find security, and, and yes, what we fear. And there's a lot to be said about, about being faithful and being wise with all of this. And also we recognize that this is a tough, tough year. These are, are difficult and uncertain times. So one, if for, for just a second, I do want to be clear about something since, since fear is a, is a part of, of what's going on in this, this parable. And, um, we hear people, people talking about fear a lot, just, just out in our, um, in our culture and our society and kind of our life together, um, practicing social distancing, limiting social engagement, wearing a, a mask. We do not do those things because we're afraid. Right? Sometimes you hear that as a, as a reason to, to not do them, to not wear a mask, to, to, to ignore um, social distancing um, restrictions and, and things, things like that. So sometimes we hear, um, we hear about that being um, a reason not, not to do them. We're not going we're not going to live in, um, we're not going to live in, in fear. So we're not going to, um, to do those sorts of, sorts of things. But listen, we do those things not out of fear, but we do them out of love, right? Love for our neighbor, love for our communities, love for the most vulnerable among us. Doing these things right now is being a good steward. I suspect, you know, we could probably come up with a, a parable somewhere in this as well, right? The kingdom of heaven is like choosing to wear a mask for the for the good and the welfare of someone else right so let's be clear um, even though we're we're talking a little bit about not uh, doing things out of fear this morning um, we do those sorts of things that we're asked to do now because of this pandemic we do them not out of fear but we do them out of love we do them out of being a good steward of our lives and the lives of, of those around us right so let's be clear on that so now back to money. There's a lot of financial uncertainty in the world right now. This pandemic has, has wrecked havoc on, on jobs and, and the economy. And so as we think about the coming year and um, our annual stewardship pledges, the reality is that some of us are not in a position to commit to a lot of giving. Some of us are in a position where rather than giving, we may need to, to receive for a bit. And that's okay. That's why we're here for each other. Because while, while stewardship always has a money component, right? It is also never really 
at its core about money. It's never about some sort of magical number of giving or anything like that. What it is about, what it is always about, is being a people who, whatever the particulars are, are the sort of people who live and act in the type of hopeful expectation that leads to joyful expectation and, and participation in the kingdom of heaven. Whatever way, whatever circumstances present themselves, it's about, it's about being that type of people. That's what stewardship is about. Being formed more and more into someone and, and being formed more and more into, into a people who are learning to lean more and more into the grace and goodness of Jesus and learning more and more the joy of living into the kingdom and of, of then being able to call and invite others to do the same. And so whether that is, that plays out in, in how we as individuals, how, how we choose to, to give and, um, and use our, our, our money time, those sorts of things, our energy, our resources, whether, whether that's how we, we choose to give to the church or how we give to, to various things working that are, that are working for the good of our communities, how we, how we live and move and, and provide in our families, and whether we're talking, again, about money, time, grace, hope, whatever it is, or whether it's how we as a church together are, are deciding and discerning and choosing to use the resources that we have, be it financial funds or our, our collective energies, our, our voice, our voices together, whatever it is. The world has enough fear dug holes. The kingdom of heaven calls us to live out and to live into something else entirely. It calls us to remember who we know our Lord to be, our good, gracious Lord, who calls us to be stewards, to be stewards in his kingdom, his kingdom that is, is present and his kingdom that we are awaiting. Stewardship is an invitation to live out and live into this very kingdom of heaven. Family, that is who we are called to be. That is who this church is called to be. That is what it means to be a steward, to live out and to live into the kingdom of heaven, even here and even now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, family. Amen.
treasure to you have entrusted came to powers grace conferred ours to use for home and kindred and to spread the gospel word open wide our hands and share it as we need Christ's endless cup healing teaching Or it is that a man going on a journey summoned his servants and entrusted his property to them. God has entrusted us with his property and we are called to be stewards of what we have. Please prayerfully consider the time, talents, or gifts you have received and how you can give them back to God in love and service to others. Let us give with glad and generous hearts. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Almighty God, we know that our talents are really not ours, but yours. You give us resources, gifts, skills, and talents to use in your service. We want to be faithful stewards, wise but not cautious, generous and joyous in our giving. Accept, we pray, this offering as a sign of our desire to be trustworthy servants of our servant Lord, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We have a few announcements this morning. Uh, the first is a reminder of our worship schedule this winter. We'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper on the first Sunday of each month. The communion elements will be available for each household to pick up at the church, leading up to each communion Sunday for your use during the live stream of the service. If you are unable to pick up yours, contact the church office and we'll make arrangements to have those elements given to you. Also, our Zoom fellowship time will be the third Sunday of each month. That's today at 12.30 p.m. Check your emails for the link for the Zoom fellowship. If it's a stewardship time, it is stewardship time, excuse me, you will be receiving information in the mail along with a pledge card soon. Please prayerfully consider how God may be inviting you to give to the ministry of this church. Our pledge dedication Sunday will be on November 29th the last Sunday of November, right after Thanksgiving, and it's also the first Sunday of Advent. Finally, Pastor Kevin will be on vacation beginning this Tuesday, November 17th through the 27th. Next Sunday, while he's away, the Reverend Karina Hoyt, who many of you know as the Young Life Area Director, uh, will be preaching next Sunday while Pastor Kevin is on vacation. Those are the announcements, and now Casta Kevin will be leading us in prayer. In prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you in prayer, knowing that our voices are accompanied by the communion of saints and the Holy Spirit. When we struggle to find the words or cannot articulate our longings, our hopes, and our fears, we trust that you know our needs even when we are unable to speak them out loud. We rest in your presence, trusting your compassion, rejoicing in your covenant love that refuses to let us go. We pray that the church would be a near reflection of its head, Jesus Christ. When the world roils in violence, Lord, make of us peacemakers. When the oppressed cry out for help, send us to bring good news in the form of justice and relief. When your children are hungry, help us to feed your sheep. Lord, may our unity in Christ be leavened for reconciliation and healing in our communities. 
Lord, we pray for our nation. In the wake of a divisive election, we recognize the the tears in the fabric of our communal life. We do not have the power to overcome animosity and rancor on our own. We need your intervention and transformation. Lord, grant those in positions of earthly power, humility and wisdom, spiritual maturity and a willingness to listen. And may each of us be catalysts for good wherever we have influence. Lord, we pray for the welfare of the world. We do not want to neglect any corner of creation because all the earth belongs to you, Lord God, and you named every inch of it good. As we live and move and have our being in you, reveal to us how to tend and nurture, be good stewards of all that you have entrusted to us. Knowing that you make us such stewards of that which does not belong to us, we ask for the courage to use all we have for your sake and in your service. And now, Lord, we pray for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Those who are known to us, we name now. And those who are known only to you, we remember in silence. Lord, bring healing, wholeness, relief, and peace to those most in need of your presence and love. We continue to pray for Bob and Kathy's son, John, and his fellow firefighters, for Rachel, for Betty's friends, Teresa, Maria, and Maxine, for Chuck, and for Marcia's mother and father, and Roberta's mother, and for Gladys at the Highlands. For all those, especially in this time of of quarantines and and stay-at-home advisories, Lord, we especially remember and lift up and pray for Dot and Marilyn and Miriam and all those at the the Chapel Hill, Waterman Lake, Atria, and, and Highlands Assisted Living Facilities. And Lord, in this time, we pray for all who are having to make difficult and stressful holiday plans. Lord, we also pray for ourselves, that we would better our neighbor with our words and actions and choices, using what we have been given for the sake of others, and that we would better love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to boldly say together when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I now invite you uh, to enjoy our virtual choir singing, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is. Oh 
and receive the benediction from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other. Beloved of God, stewards of the kingdom of heaven, may you know the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.